perspective now on Canada's place in the world in 2018 and this government's foreign policy initiatives. Roman Paris is the University Research Chair in International Security and Governance at the University of Ottawa. He has also previously served as a senior advisor to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. So Canada's relationship with the United States is almost always at the top of the agenda for Canada and NAFTA particularly so now. The Prime Minister says he's always been optimistic and still is. Are you? I think there will be a deal eventually, but there's going to be a lot of bumps on the road to get there. Uh, as we saw as recently as the uh, negotiations that took place in Montreal, Canada put some proposals on the table and in public at least, the United States just shot them straight down. And we have some big events coming up this year, including the Mexican election in July. Uh, and Mexico will not be in a position to continue political level negotiations from then all the way through to December, because that's when the new president is sworn in. And we have the U.S. midterm elections in November. So I think that the President Trump is going to have to make some decisions relatively soon, March, April, about how he wants to deal with this period of uncertainty coming forward, whether he wants to drive towards an agreement or whether he wants to begin the process of ending NAFTA. Canada has always thrived and looked for multilateral mm -hmm. solutions, whether that's on trade or other kinds of global organizations. And yet this is all now happening in a climate where it seems to be bilateral negotiations uh, seem to be the flavor. <laughs> um, what do you think that means for Canada? Well, it, Canada has always, or at least since World War II, emphasized mm -hmm. an, a, a, an active and constructive approach to international institutions and multilateralism, partly because it's a reflection of who we are. We believe in the rule of law. We want uh, disputes to be uh, negotiated. We want there to be institutions and rules, partly because it very much serves our interests as a mil middle power uh, to have an open and a stable international system, particularly for a country like ours, which is so dependent on trade. I think that, you know, we are pushing against a tide right now, mm. and it is disturbing. Uh, we have some very close allies who are still very committed to multilateralism. You think about President Macron in France, you think about Chancellor Merkel, uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Abe in, in Japan. Uh, but big key players are really questioning this. For Canada, what's important is that we keep on trying to sustain these structures to the extent that we can with those like-minded partners. I think eventually the United States comes around and says, yes, NATO is critical. Yes, the World Trade Organization and international trading rules serve American interests too. Eventually we get there, our job is to sustain those structures until the United States realizes that it actually has an interest in doing so too. <laughs> so is, is that the context in which we should look at the recent meeting in Vancouver around North Korea? Because that's you know clearly a focal point now in terms of the potential for uh, conflict. Um, and, and yet one wonders what real influence Canada might have in that situation. Canada has very, very limited role to play in the North Korean situation. You know, the key players are obviously North and South Korea, China, the United States, Japan, and to some extent Russia. Uh, Canada did have active track two diplomacy, so there were many contacts between Canada and North Korea during the 1990s, but basically for the last decade or so, we've had extremely limited contact with uh, North Korea, and the current government hasn't really changed that. So what was that meeting all about? I think there were two things. One was to reinforce the solidarity of countries that are maintaining the diplomatic and economic pressure on North Korea now, to try to get them to the table for comprehensive discussions. And the second was to send a message that we support Rex Tillerson's efforts to achieve a negotiated outcome. And, you know, he's obviously one player in the U.S. administration, and there are others who are thinking more seriously about military options. That's not something that I think Canada supports. You mentioned China yeah. in this context, but obviously that's also a key relationship that this government is looking at. Talk a little bit about the fine line that the government is going to have to walk here. China is it's, uh, it's one of the big issues that the government is probably going to have to crunch this year, mm. uh, along with the other really prominent issues like NAFTA. Uh, we, China's already our second largest trading partner. It is the second largest economy in the world. It will soon be, by some measures, the largest economy in the world. Its growth rate is essentially three times that of, uh, the, Western, of the United States and 
the other countries that we generally trade with. And it's an increasingly important player in global politics. We have to deal with China. We have to, as a society, come to a, a way of approaching China that is both that allows us to take advantage of the opportunities that are there uh, for our exporters in particular, but also to mitigate the risks involved in dealing with a country that we disagree with in a whole bunch of different areas. Walking that middle ground will take a lot of sophistication, and it can't just be a discussion about a free trade agreement, although I believe that a free trade agreement would be is something to pursue because it's about establishing rules. I was going to say, can you have agreement. a free trade agreement with a country that essentially uh, either the Canadian government or Canadians don't trust? Um, well, I think the decision right now is whether to begin negotiations right. of a free trade agreement. And if you look at how long it took us to negotiate with Europe, that was eight years. How long did the Australians take to negotiate free trade agreement with China? It took 10 years. So I think the answer to the question comes out in the substance of the negotiations themselves. Can we negotiate with them something which is which provides a measure of reliability and protection for Canadian actors in China so that they're not dealt with arbitrarily? At the same time as allowing us to continue to pursue discussions with them on human rights and security issues that are a matter of concern. Even before those negotiations have started if they do. Um, Canadians are concerned about Chinese investment in Canada. I mean, to, to a certain degree, is the government's hand not going to be forced on some level? Yes, I think that, uh, but I think that the way to think about our relationship with China is in terms of rules. And the rules also, thinking about rules allows us to, to think about ways in which we can articulate and, and uh, uh, clarify the system of rules governing Chinese investment in Canada so that we can welcome investment that serves our interest and control investment that doesn't. Rules is also about establishing a fair system of rules to ensure that we have access to Chinese markets and that they don't use kind of you know, various different uh, behind the border means to, 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 as a disadvantage to our economic actors. Rules is also about uh, the system of trade for the, for Asia and joining the TPP and the TPP itself is partly about rules and it's also about a rules-based system to govern the sovereignty disputes in the East and South China Sea. Right. Beyond these few issues that we've touched on, where do you think Canada's foreign policy needs to step up um, to prove, in fact, that it's back, yeah. as the cliche goes. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's challenging now, I think, for the government, because they effectively have a four-alarm fire south of the border. And they've done, I think, a very good job so far of dealing with the Canada-U.S. relationship, and I think most people give them credit for that. But it has sucked up a lot of the government's attention. I think, arguably, uh, not enough attention has been paid to other areas of our foreign policy, uh, including Asia, I should say. I think there are opportunities for Canada to define leadership uh, in other areas as well. So we will be hosting the G7 summit this year in June, uh, bringing together some of the most important people in the world for a whole day. How are you going to use that time? Well, Stephen Harper, I was no fan of his foreign policy. But he did, in 2010, go to Davos in the same year that he was going to be, that Canada was going to be hosting the G8 at that time. And he said, Canada is going to champion an initiative for women's health. And at the G8 meeting, he launched a major initiative which Canada led and which continued for many years and actually continues to today right. with the addition of the reproductive and sexual rights that the Liberal government brought in. My question is, with, with uh, Justin Trudeau's enormous reputational capital in the world, where he can pull basically anybody into a room, he can mobilize a coalition of like-minded countries, of international organizations, of NGOs, of private actors, driving towards a specific goal to accomplish a specific goal. What is that going to be? And will he use the opportunity of this year and the G7 as a lever for that? I hope he doesn't miss that opportunity. Okay, so then, th then the next question obviously is, if you were advising the Prime Minister yeah. today, what should that goal be? 
In the particular context of the G7 meeting, of course, one of the top priorities is to make is to maintain the integrity of the G7. So there's always the potential for the G7 to become divided because Donald Trump has a different view on climate than the G6. He has a different view on trade than the rest of the group. So maintaining the integrity of that group itself is going to be important. But if I were to give you an example of an initiative, take refugees who are stuck in limbo, who haven't been resettled to Canada or other countries, and very, very tiny proportion of refugees are resettled. Most of them are stuck in limbo outside of their country. There are millions and millions of people, and there are millions and millions of children not receiving any education at all. So I could imagine an initiative that would set as a goal providing quality primary education to 100% of children who are stuck in these protracted displacement situations for years and years and years as a way of countering the hopelessness and the lack of economic opportunity and skills that these kids will have going forward. That's the kind of, it would be ambitious, it would be hard, but, and it would require the cooperation of many, many different kinds of actors. It's the kind of thing that we could do, Canada could do. Thank you very much for your expertise and your insight. My pleasure.